uh, let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, so uh, today's speaker is Dr. Wong Yang Soon. Uh, he's worked with Orang Asli in the West Malaysia and Orang Asal indigenous communities in East Malaysia on social economic development for over 30 years using a community development approach <clears throat> that empowers and gives ownership to the community. Some of the initiatives he's involved in are in cooperatives, microfinance, income generation, capacity building, sustainable agriculture, indigenous people's land rights, and also healthcare. He was with Malaysian Care from 1992 to 2021 and served from grassroots level as a community development worker to being the executive director from 2011 to 2021. So he's currently working part-time with Lighthouse Hope Society in Ipoh that reaches out to urban poor and orang asli communities. He holds an MA in Rural Development from the University of East Anglia in the UK and a PhD from Monash University. He's married to Patricia and they have three orang asli daughters, uh, Meina, Masna and Rusan, uh, but they are not here with us today. Yeah, so uh, later on we'll introduce him up. So yeah, that's the bio data of our speaker for today. And today's scripture reading is uh, taken from two passages of scripture. First one is 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 to 2, and then Psalms 142. Okay, 1 Samuel 22, verse 1 to 2. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Psalm 142. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. This is the word of the Lord. Morning, church. So glad to be uh, here again. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Gauri, for uh, having me here. Pastor Gauri is uh, someone familiar because uh, she pastored uh, Kampar uh, before she came here, I believe. And um, I am attending uh, Kampar Wesley uh, with my wife uh, at this current time. And so thank you for uh, having me here again in Klang after about two and a half years, I think about or three years uh, since the pandemic. You know, many of us weren't able to uh, have in-person services, but praise the Lord, you know, God provides ways in which we can continue to be connected. And it's wonderful that uh, all of us are able to uh, come back together again, uh, even in these uncertain times. Uh, in the introduction that uh, was given this morning, um, uh, as you know, I've uh, moved on from Malaysian care. The last time I was here, I was still in Malaysian care, and uh, I have kind of retired from Malaysian care. Um, and uh, although I'm actually still quite young, and uh, even though I look a bit old, you know, with all the white hair, but uh, Malaysian Care's uh, retirement uh, age is 60. I'm not quite 60 yet, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, in the uh, terms and conditions uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, criteria for retirement in Malaysian Care, I qualified. Lah. So they said, okay, Yang Soon, we call it retirement. Uh, but it is uh, a time that God has asked, told me to move on uh, after serving 29 years in uh, Malaysian Care. I joined Malaysian Care when I was... Uh, 27 years old and, um, and uh, much younger, much uh, more uh, 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 energetic uh, today, less energetic, uh, perhaps a bit less young, uh, but still passionate to serve the Lord. 
And so I'm uh, part-time with the uh, Lighthouse uh, Ministry, which is actually a ministry started by uh, Canning Garden Methodist Church, uh, where they reach out to uh, urban poor uh, families. They have a, a soup kitchen in the old, uh, old town of uh, Ipoh. Um, and then we have been moving more into uh, serving uh, families who are in distress. Um, recently, uh, in fact, just last week, I was uh, visiting uh, one family uh, with my colleague, and uh, this lady had an accident, and uh, she is paralyzed uh, from uh, waist down. And uh, the, only, the only caregiver for her uh, is actually uh, her son, uh, who is just 13 years old. Uh, and so he has to take care of the mother, um, go to school at the same time, uh, you know, run the whole house, uh, basically. And uh, such uh, families actually uh, are very uh, are common in our communities. It's just that they are often very hidden and we don't know about it until, you know, uh, attention is brought to us. And I believe the Lord brought the attention of such families to, to, to us in the church so that we can do something about it. Uh, this uh, family that I mentioned, um, they are Hindus, uh, the son and the lady, but very open to the Lord Jesus Christ because you know Christians have been going in to pray for them uh, and to help them uh, in coping with such situations. And I'm sure, you know, even in the communities that you are working with, the families that you are working with, by reaching out to them and, um, and uh, impacting that situation, people will not only hear the good news, but they will actually experience it. They will feel it because there is tangible uh, change uh, in the situations due to the work that you are doing, the love that you display, and the good works that you do. So this morning, this morning, um, the, the, the message that I'd like to share is really how do we as Christians respond in times of crisis? And indeed, you know, we are living in times of unprecedented crisis. We've just gone through a pandemic which, um, which doesn't seem to be which officially is declared uh, uh, endemic now, but you know uh, the the after the aftershocks are still very much with us. And I was reading in the news recently. There's a, this new variant, uh, X X X B or something like this. Uh, and Kyrie was saying it's already here in Malaysia. Huh? There are cases here in Malaysia. Uh, he said, "Don't worry," you know. Um, and so we are not worried, lah. <laughs> okay. But of course we are worried because there's so much uncertainty. We don't know, you know how, how um, infectious the variant is. Uh, and according to the data, you know, this uh, variant is um, uh, even more uh, uh, immune to the effects of the vaccines. And so there's still this massive uncertainty about what the future holds, not only with COVID, but with so many other things which uh, are still happening in our world today. Uh, COVID, of course, uh, has um, uh, added to much of the problems. The uh, rising inflation, which, was also, which is also partly caused by COVID, but not fully. You know, we have a war in Europe after so long, and um, we have so much conflict going around even here, closer to our own uh, region, with the tensions with China and so on. And so there's this political instability as well in our own country as we go through the uh, coming general election. It's not just you know, UK that is uh, uh, causing all this uh, political instability as we watch the news, but even in our own country, we will be facing another general election and the outcomes of which uh, we are uncertain as well. Last night when I was having dinner with um, uh, friends from here, you know, uh, Brother Jesse asked me, how do you feel about voting uh, this time? And you know, for the first time in my life, I told, uh, I told him, I said, first time in my life, 
I don't feel like voting. Uh, because after all the effort that, uh, that we made um, in the last election, the outcome of that uh, was uh, so disappointing. And so this time, you know, I'm sure many of us, although we don't like to, to admit it, we don't feel like, like voting. You know, sometimes I feel like, you know, when I go to the, to the voting station, maybe I'll draw an extra box and put my own name there. <laughs> after all, it won't make much difference. But we know that the world that we live in, uh, although there are so many uncertainties, we believe that God is still sovereign and that He reigns, and that there's something for us to do as Christians to make an impact. And so, during the COVID times, uh, the Orang Asli community was very uh, uh, badly hit as well. The photo that you see here uh, was from the village just next to Ladang Ke. Some of you have visited Ladang Ke, you know? And uh, as you go in, there's an Orang Asli village just next to Ladang Ke. And um, during the COVID, uh, during the COVID uh, third wave, uh, the Orang Asli were particularly affected uh, by COVID because the virus had made its way into the community. And as you know, Orang Asli communities are very close-knit. Uh, there's no such thing as, you know, just sitting in the house. Uh, like, you know, many uh, families in the cities, you're able to, you know, just uh, wall yourself out. Um, and uh, uh, keep away from anyone. But in the Orang Asli community, there are no fences, you know, the doors are always open, people go in and out. And so once the virus came in, the, the infection spread very quickly. And the uh, Orang Asli communities are very small communities. In this village, there are only about 250 people uh, in the whole village. And out of 250 plus people, 46 were tested positive. Uh, and so if you work out in terms of the population ratio, the Orang Asli actually experience uh, more cases than the general population. Uh, and even in death rates, uh, it was much higher than the national average. In this village, out of 250 people, you know, two persons died. Um, and that works out to actually roughly 20% of the population already, whereas the national average was something like 13%. So we see that uh, communities who are poor, communities who are underprivileged actually suffer more than the average uh, population in any country. Global studies have shown that, that those who are poor suffer disproportionately because of such crises. And so we ask ourselves then, what can we do as Christians? How do we respond in such times? And I believe that as we look through uh, David's experience, King David's experience this morning, it can give us some ideas, some uh, uh, direction and path in which we can respond both for ourselves as well as for people that we are reaching out to. Each of us are not immune to crises. Each of us go through times of distress as well, whether it's in your family, whether your personal uh, journey in God, with relationships, uh, in your career, and so on. We go through times of difficulty. And um, oftentimes, those, uh, those periods are times which we, we look back on in hindsight. But during the crisis, we are at a loss what we can do. Let us go to God in prayer, even as we reflect on the words of Samuel as well as the Psalms. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We pray, O oh Lord, that even as we reflect on your word, that you will teach us, Lord. Help us, especially for my brothers and sisters here who may be going through times of difficulty. We pray that your spirit will speak to them and um, grant us, Lord, a path through these difficult uh, times in our own life as well as in the life of our nation, Lord. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So what was the context in which David was in crisis? And as we read the passage that was uh, shared this morning, 
we find that David was in extreme distress. You know, David was a national hero. Just before this time, he had uh, slain Goliath. He had defended Israel against the Philistine army. But within a very short span of time, David suddenly went from national hero to someone who was being hunted down by the king. A king that was very jealous, a king that was very vengeful. David was in such a situation because King Saul wasn't particularly a very secure person. In fact, when David got all the limelight for what he was able to do, Saul grew increasingly uh, envious, increasingly suspicious of David, thinking that David was out to usurp his power. And so Saul turned on him. And he wanted to arrest, he wanted to capture David and, and possibly, most likely, to get rid of him. And so we pick up this story from 1 Samuel 22. If you have your Bibles uh, with you, please turn with me to that. We pick it up from chapter 21, the last few verses. So I'm reading from 1 Samuel 21, verse 10 onwards. So David escaped from Saul and went to King Achish of Gath. But the officers of Achish were unhappy about his being there. Isn't this David, the king of the land, they asked. Isn't he the one the people honour with dances, singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. David heard these comments and was very afraid of what King Achish of Gath might do to him. So he pretended to be insane, scratching the doors and drooling down his beard. Finally, King Achish said to his men, Must you bring me a madman? We already have enough of them around here. Why should I let someone like this be my guest? And so here was David running away from Saul and he ended up in uh, a neighbouring uh, region, King Achish of Gath. And this was a situation which was dangerous for him and it was probably traumatic as well. Because here, Akish was an, an ally of Saul. And uh, if Akish had detained uh, David uh, at the behest of Saul, then he would have handed David over to Saul so that Saul could have his way with him. And so David knew that this was a critical situation. He was in great physical danger because of the danger of being killed. He was mentally stressed, thinking how was he going to get out of this situation? And so David had to quickly pretend that he was mad. You know, he had to pretend he was gila, crazy, in order to evade being captured. I'm sure he was also emotionally traumatized because here he felt a sense of betrayal and rejection. After all, Saul was his mentor. When David uh, uh, agreed to serve the king, David saw Saul as his mentor, someone who would guide him as he developed his ministry to Israel. But here, his mentor had turned on him, had betrayed him, and was out to kill him. And I'm sure David was also facing spiritual doubt. Because after all, hadn't God promised David that he would do great things for his community? And here he was, ostracized and running away from that very, that very mission that he seemed to have picked up from the Lord. What is he going to do in such a situation? And so there are three lessons as we see how David responded. David 
had to think quickly and we know that in the next chapter, we see that David quickly went to the cave. It says here, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, because he was in such a dangerous situation, because he was uh, mentally and emotionally stressed, he had to look for a place where he could be safe, where he could uh, regain his sanity, where he could be at peace for just a little while. And so David quickly finds this in a cave, the cave of Adullam. How many of you here have gone to a cave? I mean a literal cave, you know, not the cave of your room, you know. Or maybe some of you find that your toilet feels like a cave, you know, you hide there or something like that. But a real cave. Any of you visited Nya Caves before in Sarawak? Last night when I asked the, the congregation, I think there was only one person who visited. Oh my goodness, here, no, nobody here has visited. Okay, so, but I'm sure you have, uh, uh, you remember your, your history, or was it geography or history, um, where you read about Nya Caves, right? What is famous about Nya Caves? Anyone? Huh? There are there are humans. Uh, there are relics of human settlements there, right? Huh? Because uh, researchers, archaeologists have found uh, that there are actually uh, uh, relics of human settlements that date back over forty thousand years old. Can no? I mean, it's hard for us to imagine forty thousand years ago, let alone one year ago. Uh, we can't remember some of the things that have been happening forty thousand years ago. Uh, my wife and I, we, we went to Nya Caves a few years ago and, you know, we actually saw those uh, artifacts uh, of human settlements there. Please, you know, next time you go to Sarawak, um, you know, Sarawak is our own country, so, you know, you can go there without a passport. Uh, go there, visit uh, Nya Caves and go and see those, uh, those human uh, relic, those human settlements. Um, but, you know, you actually don't have to go back 40,000 years. Uh, to, I mean, you don't have to go back to the Nya Caves to see the 40,000-year-old relics. You know, you can go to Gua Tempurong. Anyone here been to Gua Tempurong? Ah, okay. The sister here has been to Gua Tempurong. Okay, praise the Lord. Okay, so Gua Tempurong is a lot nearer. It's in Perak. Actually, it's uh, uh, near where I live and uh, near where Pastor Gauri uh, is from. Guatumpurong is a whole complex of caves. And if you go to Guatumpurong, you can also find relics. Not 40,000 years ago, but this one was probably about 60, 50, 60 years ago when uh, during the emergency, the communist uh, guerrillas would use these caves as place of shelter. And you can still see artifacts from those times when the uh, communist uh, 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 guerrillas used that place uh, from which they could uh, launch attacks. And so, caves are natural places of shelter. Caves are natural places where you can shelter from the elements, the sun, the rain. Uh, it has water in it, which is actually quite clean. Uh, and um, uh, you can actually just live there and be safe. So David knew that. David, as a shepherd, would have known about caves because during uh, the time when he took his sheep out to the pasture, when uh, he needed to shelter from the elements, the cave, caves were natural places where he could bring his flock and shelter from the weather. Now, the second thing that caves offer, which David was looking for, was a place to hide. And caves are very dark places. I'm sure many of you have been to Batu Caves, right? No, huh? Really, huh? No, huh? You all didn't climb the 272 steps. Didn't, huh? Okay. So, my, I, I remember a friend uh, uh, of mine from Egypt, and I remember we went for a conference uh, one day, uh, one time. And I asked him, hey, you know, wow, you are so privileged. Uh, you went to the pyramids of Giza, you know. 
you must have uh, seen the wonders of, uh, of, uh, of uh, in these ancient wonders. Then he looked at me and said, no, I've actually never been there. <laughs> Most of the time, uh, we never go and visit all the famous places uh, in our own backyard. Uh. We go to Paris, uh, we go to London, uh, we go to New York and so on. But we never visit the, the treasures in our own backyard. Uh. Um, I encourage you all to, to do so, you know, because there are wonders uh, in our own uh, country. And so, above Batu Caves, the main cave where the temple is, the Hindu temple is, actually within that, that whole uh, limestone uh, complex, underneath Batu Caves is actually another series of caves. And that caves is called Dark Caves. Uh, I was a member of Malayan Nature Society uh, years ago, and uh, we made a trip into the dark caves. And you know, when you go into those caves, you can come to a point where if you switch off the lights, it is really, really dark. You cannot even see your, the tip of your nose. It is that dark. And that's why it's called dark caves. Because all light is totally cut off uh, from that place. And so caves are wonderful places if you need to hide because David knew that in the darkness of the cave with all the corners and the places to hide, if uh, Saul and his soldiers came to try and capture him, he could just be a few feet away and they wouldn't even notice that he was there. They wouldn't be able to even see him. So it was a wonderful place to hide. It was also easily defensible because if you look at that picture, you know, caves normally have one main entrance. And so if an enemy were trying to attack you, you just needed to defend uh, that entrance because the enemy cannot outflank you on the left or on the right. So these features were exactly what David knew that he needed and where he could find them. And so that is why David hit straight to the cave of Adullam to find shelter, to find safety, and a place where he can restore his sanity. So the first thing that we learn from David is that we, know, we must know what we need and where to go and find it. When we are in distress, do we know what we need and where can we go and find that help that we need? When someone has suffered a traumatic event, whether it is physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, you know, very often it's very difficult to really pinpoint what is the cause of a problem. For example, if someone has a mental illness or is suffering mental stress, depression, or schizophrenia, what is the actual triggers what is the actual cause of some of these problems. Many of us would have read how during the pandemic, the number of mental health cases uh, uh, increased exponentially because people who had underlying causes, but because they were able to work, they were able to interact, were not displaying any uh, illnesses, but because they were now confined in, for extended periods, the illness became a problem. But we do not know some of the exact triggers that caused it. Could it have been a mental problem, emotional? And as Christians, we know that mental illness can also have spiritual causes. And quite often, it is a combination of these things that trigger the onset of the illness. And so, knowing what is needed is very important. It is the same when we are working with those who are poor, the poor, poor communities. It is important that we know what is needed. Many of us have a, a good intentions. We see a situation and we want to help. But sometimes, when we don't know what is really needed, we can actually do more harm than good. 
Uh, and so it is important that besides having that compassion, that uh, feeling of uh, wanting to assist someone in need or a community in need, that we also learn about the situation and understand the context and then find the best way in order to help them. For example, Brother Jesse, you were sharing about the uh, refugee schools. And uh, refugees face a very complex situation when they are here in Malaysia. It's not just about giving them access to a school, but the fact that there is more than just uh, setting up a school that is needed. And that is why they set up this preschool, this uh, preparatory phase, so that the children can have an early preparation before they even enter the more formal schools. And so that is one example of how we understand the needs, know what is needed, and then find a good solution in order to really impact the situation. And so, brothers and sisters, as we look at these needs then, it is important that we gain the knowledge and the skills that are needed in order to be able to help whichever community we are reaching out to. For example, you know, with the Orang Asli, many issues plague the Orang Asli community from uh, poverty, economic uh, uh, development, to education, to healthcare, land rights, and so on. And so, it is important then to be able to understand what is the situation of each community so that we can help them in the best possible way. Many people want to reach out to the Orang Asli community, but in doing so, we must make sure that we reach out to them in the right way. We do not want to create additional dependency. For example, many groups that I've seen over the years working with Orang Asli, they come in and they just hand out a lot of things. And that is not the best way to work with the community because very often then we create a sense of dependency. You know, um, the, 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 the usual description is that you know, these are all the Santa Clauses coming in. And so we don't want to create more dependency. We want to empower the community so that they themselves will be able to stand up and be able to manage their development themselves uh, in the years ahead. So David knew what he needed and he knew where to find it. And so similarly, we, when we do missions, we need to know what is needed and where we can equip ourselves to be able to help. But beyond all these things of skill, of knowledge, the most important thing that we need is God. And David, no exception, knew that very much. And that is why we read in Psalm 142, this was a prayer that David said while he was holed up in that cave. It is a psalm that is very moving and it is a psalm that as we read it in its context, imagine David is in the cave now, that dark place, he's alone and he has just escaped from being hunted for, by Saul. And he cries out to God. He says this, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my trouble. And this is David. He had just escaped from a dangerous situation. He's sitting there in the cave and he cries out to God. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way in the path where I walk. People have hidden a snare for me. You know, you can just sense how he's describing the situation he got out of. The snare. King Akish was there, ready to capture him. 
And if not for David's quick thinking to act like a madman, he would have been snared. God saved him. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. David is crying out to God. He is complaining to God. I'm all alone here in the cave. There's no one here on my left. There's no one around me. I am, I am alone and no one cares whether I live or die. So David cries out to God, but he knows that God does not forsake him, that God will not abandon him. And he goes on to say in verse 5, I cry to you, Lord, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. How many of us, when we go through a time of distress, there's, it seems like we are going through it alone. Nobody seems to understand what we are going through. And so the only person we can call out to is God. And I'm sure many of us understand how David feels. And we too can cry out to God and say, You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. David goes on to say, Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. And we cry out to God because we need somebody to be with us. We need God to understand and to say that he hears us and that he is with us. And so as David cries out to God, God answers him. The second thing that we learn from David is that support from family and friends is vital. You see, in verse 7, he says, Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. And God answers his prayer. Because we read in Samuel, it says here, And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And so somehow, as David is holed up in the cave, his family receives news that he is in danger and where he has gone to take shelter. So what do they do? Did they run away? Did they ignore him? No, they rallied around him. They went there to the cave to be with him, to give him the support he needed. And I'm sure they needed support as well because being the family, the, the family of David, they were themselves in danger. And so all of them went there to support each other, to support David. And I'm sure when they were there in the cave, they would have cooked for David, they would have, you know, guarded the cave entrance, kept watch for the enemy, and then they would have given each other emotional and mental support and they would have prayed for one another. You know, friends, I think without this kind of support, I doubt if David would have recovered from the ordeal. And this tells us how important it is for someone in distress or a community who is in distress needs the social and spiritual support from others. Family especially play a particularly important role in this. And when I say family, I would include the wider family of the church. Each of us are in a family, a family of believers. It is not just our biological family, but the family of believers. We support each other when we face distress. When we see a church member, when we see 
a fellow believer going through times of difficulty, we support them through prayer, through various kinds of help, by being sometimes physically there, by providing the support that that person needs. I remember during my own time, when my family went through times of difficulty, it was not just my immediate family that supported us, but the family of the church, my colleagues in Malaysian care, they came and supported us. They cooked for us, they cleaned the house for us, you know, they prayed with us, whether it was nowadays, you know, you don't have to be physically with the person. You can pray through WhatsApp, Zoom, uh, all kinds of ways uh, to support those who are in distress. And that is so vital. I believe, you know, I, my family would not have gotten through the crisis if not for that kind of support. Even for communities, this is no different. During the COVID crisis, the Orang Asli community was in great distress. As I shared to you earlier in the third wave, the community was very badly hit by the pandemic. And many Orang Asli uh, communities fled back into the forest in order to escape infection. And that was actually a very traditional response. In the, in the uh, past, what happened was that if there was an infection that they didn't know about, then they would actually move the whole village to deeper into the jungle. And so that was actually uh, a traditional way of social distancing. You know, now we know the word so well, social distancing. Huh? We keep one meter apart. This one, huh, they actually went to another hill in the jungle in order to keep those people who were suspected of infection away. And so, during this uh, uh, third wave, uh, during the COVID third wave, many families fled back into the jungle in order to avoid infection. But you know, 50, 100 years ago, the Orang Asli could do that. Today, the Orang Asli community, the population is much bigger. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, just some figures. When, um, when uh, uh, in, uh, just after the war, when uh, the census was taken, the Orang Asli community was only about 50,000. Today, there are about 217,000. Uh, so the population has multiplied. Uh, and not only the, the population of the Orang Asli has grown, but the amount of forest has shrunk because of development, because of uh, people taking their land. So the amount of forest has also reduced. So you have a bigger population, but you have a smaller space in which to survive. And so for many Orang Asli communities who went into the forest, they couldn't survive there for long because after about a month or two, they had already depleted all the resources in the forest, all the wild boar already. And so they could not depend anymore on just surviving in the forest. And so they had to depend on outside help. And that is where Christians, churches, NGOs uh, came in. They brought in food aid, they brought in essentials in order to support the community through that time. And this is how we support one another during times of crisis. You know, during the floods uh, here in uh, Klang Valley uh, earlier this year, uh, I, I'm sure many of you remember how many churches in this area were flooded in. And Christians from all over the place came to help clean the place, to help, you know, uh, uh, set the church, churches back uh, on their feet. And so support is so important during times of crisis, whether it is an individual, whether it is a community, whether it is a family. Those of us who go through a cave, go through a, the times of a cave, we know that. And when we have gone through, then 
we can also help others who are in such situations. The third thing that we learn from David is that times of distress can lead to times of opportunity. And so in verse 2 it says, And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. You know, I think the word, the adage, birds of a feather flock together, is a good way to describe what was happening in the cave of Adullam. And so at first, it was David. He came to the cave alone to shelter, to be safe. His family heard he was there. And then they came, rallied around him to support him and each other. And then all of a sudden, little by little, there was this group of people who were trickling in into the cave as well. And if there's one word to describe this bunch of people, this motley group of people, I would likely call them losers. Now, why do you think they're losers? Because the Bible tells us it was people who were in distress, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. All these people who were in distress started coming as well. And then there were people who owed money. You know, all these are the ones who go and borrow money from Alongla or somewhere, you know, or the banks. Well, I don't know whether there were banks at that time. But, you know, uh, you know their credit cards you know, were all maxed out already. And so they were all coming in to the cave. And then a third group of people were those who were just bitter about anything and everything, what life had handed to them. Wow, what a wonderful group. Wouldn't you like to have such a group of people in your church? And there were 400 of them. Can you imagine uh, if your church was filled with such people? I think this is actually a better way to recruit church members than any other way. Find people who are in distress, who are in default, and who are just disgruntled with life, and your church would be filled to capacity. So why were all these people in the cave? What made them gravitate towards David? I believe it is because they knew that David would be empathetic towards them. After all, David was going through the same hardships as they were. David felt the same way that they were feeling. Now, their underlying reasons may have been different. David was there because he was rejected by the king. He was being hunted down by the king. Many of these people could be there because of their own fault. But yet, the feelings were the same. They felt rejected. They felt distressed. And David knew how they felt. And they knew that David knew. They knew that David would understand them. One thing I observe in ministry, in my many years of ministry, is that those who have recovered from a similar background are very often much better placed to help those who are in the same trouble. For example, my colleagues in Malaysian care who were former drug addicts, they are much better placed to help addicts because they know their background. They know what they're going through. They know when they're telling the truth and when they're trying to pull a fast one on you because they themselves have gone through a similar experience. Similarly, my Orang Asli colleagues are also much better placed to help their own community than someone from outside. There was one village that we uh, went through in the early years when I first started work. Uh, and this village is very far in in the interior. And very often, people would go in there and try and exploit, exploit them. They would take their land for other projects 
and the orang asli would be displaced from their very own land. They would hire them to work in their projects, but at the end of the day, they would pay them a pittance. And so, many times the orang asli came to us to ask for help. And over the years, we helped train them, we helped build their capacity, we helped them develop strategies and uh, give them confidence to stand up to such exploitation. And very soon, they were able to organize themselves and then fight many of these types of exploitation. And so today, that community is at the forefront of much of the uh, land rights defense and orang asli right defense efforts that are happening. They go out to other orang asli communities who are in need of advice, who are in need of uh, support, who are facing the issues that they faced 10, 20 years ago because they have gone through a similar experience and now they use that experience to help others in distress. Friends, when we go through a time of distress, there is a purpose because God wants us to use that experience to help others. And I think the supreme example of empathy is found in our Lord Jesus Christ, God who became man. You know, in the Old Testament, we remember as we read the book of Job, when Job went through all that experience of distress, his uh, family, his business, uh, he himself underwent much suffering. And then when he cried out to God, the only way God could answer him was that, Job, you are the created. I am the creator. You cannot understand what I am doing. Because it is true, Job was only a created being. How could he under ever understand the mind of the Creator who created the heavens and earth. But God's answer was an answer that could not satisfy immediately the feelings of Job because God at that time did not experience the exact thing that humans experience until the Lord Jesus Christ came down to earth. Jesus experienced human suffering and distress. Jesus wept when Lazarus died. That was an emotional response to a dear friend who had died. Jesus went through mental distress at the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed that he could be released from the task ahead. Jesus went through physical pain when he was nailed to the cross. Jesus, God, experienced human suffering and he knows it when we experience the same thing because he has gone through the same thing. He can empathize fully with each and every one of us when we go through times of distress, when we go through suffering. Hebrews 4 15 to 16 tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. So this bunch of losers were drawn to David because he could empathize with them. However, it wasn't just that David could understand them that attracted him, but they could sense that David could also lead them out of their present predicament. After all, this was David who slew Goliath. This was David who defeated the Philistine armies. And so, from a state of personal distress, God set before David an opportunity to help others overcome 
there are situations of distress and despair. This picture here is uh, from a Lighthouse, and um, we uh, have been uh, running the uh, soup kitchen since the pandemic uh, closed down the services. It was just recently restarted on Malaysia Day. Uh, and so, you know, it is a response to many who are facing distress in cities. And I'm sure even here in Ipoh, you know, uh, communities are in distress that you are reaching out to. By helping others in need, then David himself was blessed. And how was David blessed? Because those men who were in the cave with him later would become his mighty force of warriors. And they would become his most loyal and effective fighting men who would serve with him during his kingship. Friends, God always has a purpose when we go through times of distress. When we are in the middle of it, it is hard to see what is the purpose of it. Why is it worthwhile going through it? We often ask God, why do we need to go through such times? Yet, it is often in hindsight that we see how God has seen us through those difficult times. And those difficult times help build our maturity and resilience. And it is His purpose for us to use this newfound maturity and resilience, the knowledge and the experiences to help others who are going through their times of distress. How many of us here would choose to go and stay in a cave? After hearing my message, any of you have an interest now to go and stay in a cave? Uh, no, uh? okay. Okay, la, I mean, even if you don't want to stay, uh, please go and visit, you know, Batu Caves, Nya Caves, or something. Uh? Just to see what a cave offers you. But I'm sure, you know, nobody actually would purposely choose to go and stay in a cave. Other, other than, of course, if you're a caveman or a cave woman uh, or a mystic or a hermit or a religious hermit. Yet, the path of the cave is a path that every follower of Jesus must go through. It is a difficult, it is often a long path, full of dangers. But friends, we don't need to travel it alone. We have each other. We have a wider family of believers to help us through when we go through times of difficulty, to travel alongside us when we need people to pray for us, to give us a word of encouragement. Most of all, we have God who promises to never leave us or forsake us. Let me close with this passage from Psalm 73. It says, Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. May we be strengthened and encouraged by His presence and promises, even as we travel on the path of the cave. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for being with us whenever we face times of difficulty. Lord, you promise that you will never forsake us. You will never leave us. Lord, sometimes we, we do not know where you are in the midst of our distress, but you have always been with us. You send people to come around us, 
to pray and support us. Lord, I want to pray for any of my brothers and sisters here who may be going through times of difficulty, whether it is in their families, in health, in their careers, where they, where they are feeling alone, where they are feeling stressed. Lord, you comfort them. You heal them, O oh Lord. And Lord, we know that for all these things that we go through, you have a purpose for it. We may, we may not be able to see it today, but Lord, we know that you are building us up to maturity and resilience so that we may reach out, Lord, to those around us who go through the same time of distress. Lord, I pray for this church, even as they've set out those plans to reach out to communities who are in distress, families who need people to come alongside them. I pray, O oh Lord, that through their work, their good works and their love, that many will not only hear the good news, but they will feel it, they will experience it physically, socially, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. That through the hands and feet that are here in this congregation, that this community here in Klang and many other places, Lord, will be blessed and they will acknowledge you as their Lord and Saviour. So thank you for this morning. Thank you for being with us. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.